If you will, open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke. We continue uh, our sermon series there, Luke chapter 14. And we're going to begin reading in verse 1. And we'll be reading uh, through uh, verse 24. Again, the Gospel of Luke uh, chapter 14, uh, beginning uh, in verse 1. It seems like that uh, oftentimes uh, in the church uh, we have adopted uh, a philosophy that goes something along these lines that we uh, go along to get along. Uh, That is that uh, uh, whatever the the world, whatever the culture uh, dictates to us, uh, we don't want to be Uh, controversial, we don't want to be drawn into conflict, so uh, we're going to just go along with whatever. Uh, uh, The government says uh, don't meet together. Uh, We say, okay, we don't want to create any type of controversy. Uh, The the culture says, well, well, don't speak about this issue or that issue. Well, we'll remain silent so that we can get along uh, with everyone. And let me assure you, in that uh, pursuit of cooperation, there will always be the reality of compromise. That there will always uh, be, for for the sake of of everybody kind of locking arms and joining hands together uh, and, and trying to all work together and peacefully coexist, Uh, there will always be uh, the real danger and the real reality of the loss of the uniqueness, uh, the truthfulness, uh, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we can look very easily at the examples of our Lord Jesus and even those that would follow after Him that they... We're never shy about wading into controversy or conflict. And it was ultimately for the sake of truth and even beyond that for the sake of the good of the souls of those who heard Him speak to these issues. And so let's look this morning as uh, uh, we continue, I think thematically, uh, as we have over the last several weeks, uh, at Jesus as he uh, navigates his way through the continuing uh, controversy, consternation, and conflict. Uh, Read with me, verse 1. One Sabbath, when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. And behold, there was a man before him who had dropsy. And Jesus responded to the lawyers and Pharisees saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Then he took him and healed him and sent him away. And he said to them, Which of you, having a son or an ox that has fallen into a well on a Sabbath day, will not immediately pull him out? And they could not reply to these things. Now he told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, when you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He said also, To the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But 
when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many, and at the time for the banquet he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field and must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I go to examine them. Uh, Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife and therefore I can't come. So uh, the servant came and reported these things to his servant. Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled, blind and lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. Pray with me. Father, once again we thank you for your truth. Uh, We are a people who have been saved through the proclamation and the receiving and believing of your truth, may we be a people whose lives are defined by your truth. May we live in light of, in view of the hope that is uniquely ours because we know salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, may you be honored in what, has, what will be said here today. May we, as your people, may we be transformed uh, by your grace and for your glory. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As we come to this particular text today, we see the repeated setting or even the the repeated motif of the... uh, fellowship that would occur over the course of a meal. This is the fourth time that Luke records for us that Jesus uh, responded to, accepted uh, an invitation uh, to dine with someone, most often dining with his enemies. Overlapped here, not only uh, do we have the occasion of the sharing of a meal, but for the fifth time, the engagement uh, of the issues uh, pertaining to Sabbath law, Sabbath regulations. And so we can see rather readily that Jesus knows to whom he is speaking, that he is aware of the issues that they have related to him, that indeed... They are out to get him, and yet he continues rather uh, in a straightforward manner, speaking directly to him, to them. Now, to be sure, he knew that there was going to be controversy, and there was going to be conflict, and there was going to be consternation, and he never shied away from those realities. Now, unlike many of us sometimes, he did not do it just for the sake of aggravating and inflaming. Okay? He did it for the good of their souls and because it's recorded for us, the good of our our souls. And so we see here, first of all, the controversy aggravated. There, once again, we're told that on the Sabbath he responds to an invitation to dine at one who is the leader of that uh, local uh, synagogue. He is a, a Pharisee. And notice that Luke wants us to know they were watching him carefully. Back in chapter 11, 
verse 54, the Pharisees are described as lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. That is, the Pharisees are trying to uh, set a trap for Jesus that they might label, lay, uh, levy both uh, civil and religious indictments against him uh, to bring about uh, his demise so that they may be rid of, of him. And so in a sense, maybe in our vernacular we would say, Jesus wades right in and tees it up for them. That is, he did not in any way uh, try to uh, uh, give any credence to their objections uh, as to what he did and when he did it and how he did it, uh, that he continued to do uh, what he had always done uh, right there in their midst. Now, one of the interesting things, and I think that Luke does at a, at a, at a literary level uh, just an absolutely beautiful job in, in relating these things to us. In speaking of these uh, times of table fellowship, there's an irony there. That is the, the point of inviting someone to a meal that is that you may celebrate kind of a commonality, that there should be a, a, a kind of a, a joyful uh, opportunity to get to know one another. Well, the irony is this. The, the people that invited Jesus into their home, namely the Pharisee here, hated Jesus. There was no desire for fellowship, there was only the desire to entrap him so that he could be, uh, be destroyed. And, and then there's kind of this incongruity that, that Jesus, as much as the, uh, the Pharisees uh, have a very devious motive in doing what they do, uh, Jesus, as I said previously, doesn't just go along to get along. Uh, in, in a way, he, 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 is, he is not the uh, hospitable guest in, in that uh, we understand that for the most part, you don't go into somebody's home and upset the apple cart. Uh, you don't go into somebody's home and begin to disrespect what they do and what they think. But Jesus knows very clearly the issues that the Pharisees have for him and knows, if you look there at verse 2, and behold. Now I think that's, and I think for, for Luke that's almost a uh, sarcastic kind of exclamation. Kind of like, well, son of a gun. There he was. And I think a lot of commentators, and I tend to believe this, that this fellow was a plant. That, that this guy that had a, an obvious affliction was brought into that particular meal for the sake of bringing to bear upon Jesus the opportunity to once again hang himself. And so this guy is described as having dropsy. Now that, my, my mother was born on, on Sand Mount. And I, I think they had to pipe in sunshine to wherever it was that uh, she was born. And so they had a lot of names for a lot of afflictions and diseases that I've certainly never, never heard of. And dropsy kind of sounds like one of those names, but, but dropsy is not really a disease as much as a symptom that uh, could be caused by a number of, of diseases. It's, it's actually, I think, what we would call edema. The Greek is uh, uh, hydropikos, uh, and, and hydro is, is the word that comes into English as hydro, hydroelectric, hydraulics, the idea of fluid or water. And so what was going on with this man is he was retaining fluids, okay? And according to the Levitical standards, Leviticus chapter 15, uh, said that those that uh, were, were swollen and were retaining water uh, were ceremonially unclean. And so, if you'll notice here, Jesus knows the law. He knows that from the perspective of these Pharisees, this man is not only sick, 
but he's ceremonially uh, unclean. And so, as the man stands before Jesus, Jesus speaks directly to the lawyers and the Pharisees and asks them a question that he has asked before. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? And we've seen that question in a number of different ways of, of phrasing uh, previously in Luke. So, he's putting, in a sense, the ball in their court. You think about this. Is it indeed a lawful thing, understanding there is legitimate Sabbath law, and, and the concept of the Sabbath even predates the law? We have mentioned that previously, that the concept of the Sabbath is rooted in creation, because God rested on the seventh day after His creative activities in the course of the previous six days. And so, Jesus is asking a, a very difficult question. You know, sometimes we get into discussions around here, uh, doctrinal type discussions, and sometimes it, it gets to a, a, a kind of a difficult level and like, oh, that's, that's, that's really kind of a tough one. And so, what, 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 tr what trumps here? Obedience to God's stated law or responding to one of, who is afflicted in mercy. Now, there was a kind of a, a compromised way out, you might say. Notice what Jesus didn't do. Hey, fella, you know, get, come here, let me talk to you. Just a minute. Pulls him off the side and says, come back tomorrow. Come back tomorrow, and, and we'll avoid any kind of conflict here. You know, I'm a guest, and, you know, a, a guest should always be gracious. And, and so I, I, I don't want to get these... I mean, you know, I've kind of been there and done that and got the T-shirt when these guys get to rocking and rolling. And, and so, just come back tomorrow. That would have been enough. I mean, it, it wasn't really, I mean, it was a terrible affliction, but he probably wasn't going to die that day. You know, chances are. And, and so, he could have avoided all controversy. But he willingly and intentionally chose to inflame the hostility of the Pharisees by doing what? First of all, asking them a question. You think about it. You stretch and strain your brain and you think about this question. Notice what they did. They remained silent. Now, y'all kind of laugh with me. Sometimes I'll, I'll say, I'm going to ask you a question. If you say yes, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. If you say no, I'm going to tell you you're wrong. Okay? And I love doing that to you. It's fun. It's one of the few fun things preachers get to do. You know, when you're a preacher, you make a vow. I pledge to never have any fun for the rest of my life. Okay? It's kind of what we do. Now, now, so that, that's one of the few ways that I can that I kind of have fun. Well, you know, Jesus did ask a question here that, that you know, it's, it's a tough one. It really is. Theologically, it, it is a, a tough one. But he very quickly and very clearly clears the way for an appropriate understanding. Now, he, he took the man and he healed him first of all. And, and presumably, maybe grasped him by the shoulders. Now remember what? He's not only sick, he's what? He's ceremonially unclean. And so Jesus went in and, and touched him to make sure that they knew and understood exactly that Jesus was receiving this man and by his power, he heals him and then he sends him away. And... And maybe, I don't know, possibly, young man or old man, whatever he was, things may get ugly here. And I just don't want you to see it. I don't know. Sends him away, and then he continues his interaction uh, with these Pharisees. Look there at verse, verse 5. He explains to him, and by, again, uh, Asking them a question, he said to them, which of you having a son or an ox that has fallen in the well on Sabbath day will not immediately pull him out? Again, that, that the, the, the urgent need for mercy overshadows the, uh, the, the string, stringent and wooden and legalistic and ultimately spiritually vac, uh, vacuum of just obeying the law so that you can say, I am a keeper of the law. Look at everyone out there who's not. Again, remember the problem of the Pharisees was they reduced every aspect of the law 
to that which they could externally keep and point to themselves as keepers of the law. Again, self-promoting, promoting their own righteousness. And again, their, their quote-unquote goodness, that is their supposed obedience to the law, was actually what stood between them and salvation by grace through faith in the accomplishment of the work of Jesus Christ. That, that was a hindrance. You, you, when we talk about repentance, usually I'll say something. You have to repent of your goodness just as much as you have to repent of your badness. If there is something in your life that you think makes you acceptable to God, or maybe even just maybe slightly more, I mean, I'm, I'm bad, I'm not perfect, but I'm certainly not as bad as, and you fill in the blank. If you've got anything in, in you like that, you need to repent. You must repent of that. Not only repent of what everybody agrees is really, really bad, but you may need to repent of that which some people think is really, really good. And so again, their own sense of self-righteousness stood between them and the Savior. And so he silenced them. Interestingly enough, they have, they have no rebuttal, simply only a, a seething, uneasy silence. But it is not a silence by which they think, well, maybe he's right. It is a silence by which we have been put down by that which Jesus has said and, and done. But let me tell you, we're going to come up with a scheme. We're going to figure this thing out. He may have stumped us here, but we'll be back for another round. And so, Jesus begins to teach them. Not only does he kind of stick it to them in round one, he comes back for two more rounds. Not, not only is he a less than gracious guest, I think he's really becoming a nuisance for the glory of God and the proclamation of the gospel. Now, I, I'm, I am not here to promote or, or uh, try to tell you, hey, we all need to be jerks for Jesus. I don't, I don't mean that, and I've told you many times. Uh, I have a way many times of irritating people, and one of the fears that, that I have is something that, that you know, I think is silly or funny, being so offensive to someone that it would stand uh, in the way of them hearing uh, the truth of the gospel. And, and, and that's something I would never... Uh, want uh, to happen, okay? And so, again, Jesus is doing what he does, and of course he is absolutely righteous in, in, in what he does. Now, sometimes I sinfully preach, uh, speak the truth, and you do too. Because what? I just want to get you. I, I just want to get you. I, I just want to get back at you. It, oh, what I'm saying is true, but it is, again, not out of a, a pure heart. But Jesus proceeds, and again, uh, I call this section, verses 7 through 11, their consternation escalated. He pours gas on the fire. I mean, he could have just said, well, guys, let's just eat, and you know, we'll sing Kumbaya when it's over, and I'll walk off into the sunset. You know, no harm, no foul. Oh, no, 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 no. He keeps punching their buttons. And here is the interesting thing, and it, and it threw me. It, took, it, was, it was several days into my study uh, before I saw this. But one of the kind of the literary devices I think is really cool with, with, with Luke here is verses uh, 7 through 11 are the mirror images of 12 through 14. In 7 through 11, uh, Jesus speaks in regards to the, the guest and kind of the, the, the way a guest should act. And in 12 through 14, he speaks to the host and how they should act. And so there, there's kind of a way that these, these things aren't conflicting with each other. They complement one another in a way to complete uh, the message that Jesus uh, wants them uh, to, to hear. And certainly, it would have been very easy for Jesus to say, you know, i got things to do, and I really don't have time to fool with you. Because I know that you're a bunch of hard heads. I know you're a bunch of hard hearts. And there's no sense in me wasting my time. But he very mercifully tries to unpack 
the reality of their condition before a holy God. And so we see here, first of all, uh, the observation. Now, now, kind of again, this, this little bit of a, a contrast. Notice back up into uh, verse 1. They were watching him carefully. Well, guess what? He was watching them too. He was watching them too. And so he, he noticed that, that how uh, that they, uh, when they arrived at the uh, fellowship meal, he noticed how they kind of arranged themselves. And again, uh, ancient Judaism was what typically is called an honor society. Uh, your, your position within the society was a tremendously important thing. And so uh, the way that you would be seated uh, at, a, at a meal would reflect your status. And the closer to the host you were, the higher your status. And so again, he noticed that there were people that wanted to, that presumed that they were the most honorable person there, and so they made sure that they got close to the host. And so Jesus tell, tells them a, a parable to expose uh, their, their folly. Verse 8, <clears throat> When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor, lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited you both will come and say to you, give your place to this person. And then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. Now, again, don't, in other words, be careful because if you act in this manner, you set yourself up to be embarrassed by the reaction of the host. I, I couldn't help, again... As I, I looked at this this week to be reminded, and I'm not trying to be off color here, okay, just, of the old Miller Lite commercial with Bob Euchre, Mr. Baseball. And it begins with him, hey, us ex-major leaguers, we're all big, big things. We're, we're special, we're special. I got free tickets to the ball game. And oh, right here and right close. And then all of a sudden, hey, buddy, you're in the wrong seat. Well, I guess I must be going to the front row. I'm going to be honored. Well, guess what? What's the upshot of the commercial? Long shot of him sit sitting in the upper deck at the very far reaches of the outfield. And kind of the joke is, he doesn't even realize what? That he's been dissed. That he's been shamed. And so you see the, the same kind of stuff. He very presumptuously sits in a good seat. And then when corrected, he thinks, I'm going to get even a better seat. But the joke is what? No, you're way out in the outfield. Kind of a similar concept here. That, that when you show up at something, you choose for yourself because you have such a high opinion of yourself that you would see it sit in a place of honor. The better strategy is to take a, a place or a position or a seat of lesser honor and then the possibility exists that somebody comes, oh, hey, hey. Josh, let me sit you up next to me because you are special. And so you get to strut to the front of the room. Okay? And so, verse 10, again, the instruction, take, take the lowest place. That way the host will have the opportunity to honor you. And, and then the, uh, the principle, the, the warning. Look there, verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Very similar concept, principle of uh, the, the, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. That, that, that we, we looked this morning in Sunday school and we talked about uh, uh, Paul's development of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ in that great com uh, confession in Philippians 2. And at, at the center of what's going on there is this pronouncement that Jesus Christ humbled himself. That, that, that he did not cling to that which was rightfully his, namely the enjoyment and the privilege of his own well-deserved glory. That, that he set it aside for the sake of the incarnation, the incarnation for the sake of, of, of the atonement. And again, as much as Paul wants us to understand theology and particularly Christology, he wants us to 
cultivate what? That same attribute of humility. And so, uh, again, Jesus warns them, those that have uh, this entirely unfounded attitude that results in their own self-promotion will find themselves ultimately what? Humbled when their lack of righteousness is, is exposed. And so again, uh, if you'll remember that we see similar parables to this uh, in, in other gospel accounts, and, and, and Jesus takes that opportunity and says, you know, you, that, that you must humble yourself as this little child. Again, you, you, you must not have the presumptuousness, presumptuousness of your greatness, that you must humble yourself and, and be converted, even, is his language there. And so there's a, an association that that we must be humbled in terms of our own self-righteousness to receive this great reality of the gospel, of the grace of God. And then the Christian life is ultimately the nurturing, and cultivation of the character of Christ, inclusive of this apprehension, appreciation, and embracing of humility. And we see it, we're called, we're called to that uh, all through uh, the epistles. And so, we see here in this encounter, the controversy is aggravated, their consternation is escalated, and then this third thing is the conflict is exasperated, or exacerbated. Uh, so, verse 15, he gives some initial uh, instructions. When one of those who reclined at the table with him heard these things, he said very spiritually, with hands folded before Him. Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Okay? How many of you have been in a bit of a discussion and people are getting, they're kind of bowing up. They don't, they don't like what's being asserted as being biblical and true. And some nervous person well, I'm just thankful we're all saved. I'm just so thankful. I'm so, everybody's saved. Thank, thank the Lord. And what are they doing? They, they, they realize there's a tension in the air, and 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 and, and you know, some well mean you know, okay, well, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, you know, that kind of thing. And so I think that's what the, this guy's getting a little nervous. I mean, everybody's getting a little punchy here, okay? And so, yeah, at least we're all Christians, okay? Well, let me tell you something. There are certain things that if you express them as your doctrinal convictions that would give me concern as to whether or not you're even a Christian, and no matter how uncomfortable it is, we need to give some attention to that. Okay? It's not the presumption. Well, we're just all really good Christians here, and, you know, just, you know we, we'll just agree to disagree, and, you know, all, all this stuff. Well, sorry. No. So... He, he, he responds to that, and again, he, he, he illustrates it. He tells a, another story, another parable. And so he tells this parable of, of a man that gave a great banquet and invited many. Now, I'm trying not to use some of my favorite words here, okay? But if they're not ticked off now, by George they're going to be. Because they understand, they are going to understand what Jesus is saying to them in this parable. That you have been privileged by God Almighty to be invited as children of Abraham, to be invited. You've had the saving revelation given through the law and the prophets and the sacrificial system. God has revealed Himself to you savingly in a way he's, He has not revealed Himself to any other people. You have been invited. And now, you're making excuses. And the upshot is what? You are now going to be left out. I mean, <laughs> do you get what Jesus is getting at here? That's, that's, that's pretty pointed. That's not, well, we're all just nice guys here, and, 
everybody's just trying to get to the same place. And, I, you know, I'm going to give you the Jesus way, but, but, but certainly you could take the self-righteous, self-serving uh, way that you have. And, you know, we're just, you know your, way, your way may be a little curvier and a little more appeal, but, but it is a way. That's not what Jesus does here, okay? So, he begins to tell uh, this parable, those who are invited in, in, in the ancient world, Evidently, there was kind of a two-fold invitation system. Uh, the first step, we would call it the RSVP. Uh, that is, you get that thing in the mail, and it says, RSVP by, and to whom? And you call them or put a letter, you know, and it better be a pre-stamped envelope if y'all send me any RSVPs, okay? Just remember that. But you send that back, and you say, I'll be there, and I'm bringing my 14 kids, so be prepared. You know, there you go, amen, amen. But, but you're saying that I'm coming. That means fix me some food. That means the, 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 the person that's doing the inviting is making food just for you to be there. And so, just as our, in our day, in the ancient world, if that initial invitation... You're invited to a great banquet, and you say, I'll be there. I'll be there with bells on. You know, for you not to show up is the very height of being impolite and ungrateful and you know, being a jerk. Okay, uh, that, that's, just, that's just bad manners, bad, bad form. Well, they come up, and, and commentators kind of divide, and I don't know. Were they really legitimate excuses that were legitimate providentially? Or they, were they just what they were? Flimsy excuses, and just something better came up. Okay? Uh, some, or again, they were just more involved with the mundane affairs of life. But at any rate, at the end of the day, they did not follow through, even though they had originally said yes, now they were saying no. And this, again, inflamed the host. And so he instructs those servants that originally extended that initial invitation, when you go out and, and, and you invite, you go out into the streets of the city, you go everywhere and invite the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And they say, well, we've, we've done that. We've, we've done that. And then he, he says, well, go out into the highways and the hedges and compel people to go. You go everywhere. You, you may think that, that they're not worthy of being associated or being invited, but you invite everybody. Because what? I've prepared plenty, and there is ample room. And so, again, what I, I, I think what's going on here, again, Jesus is getting at that same truth we looked at a couple of weeks ago. Jews, this door of opportunity is closing on you. You have been invited. You have been invited, and you have rejected that invitation. Remember a couple of weeks ago we talked about the urgency of repentance. Let me tell you something. There is an urgency of, to the gospel message. Okay, Always has been and always will be. And so, Jesus is saying, now, you have been invited. You have rejected that invitation. Now, where, where, where is the invitation going? The, the invitation is going to anybody and everybody, anywhere. And the invitation is, is universal in the sense that all are invited. I have ample grace. I have ample provision who, for all who will come. And so, he extends that kind of unilateral invitation. And notice, notice here too, kind of, it's kind of a literary thing. In verse 16, he responds to our friend who says, well, thankfully everybody's a Christian here, okay? Okay, he responds, but here in verse 24, that you is a plural. And so he is saying to everyone who hears, I, I'm indicting all of you. This is for everyone. None of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. None who were in the first group, they are now excluded. And again, the underlying message is what? That just as Paul explains to us in Romans 11. Now, I don't mean this as any kind of racial thing or anything like that. It's just a reality that the Jews nationally have been blinded 
their hearts have been hardened by God for their rejection of His Son, Jesus Christ, until the Gospel is proclaimed in all of the highways and all of the hedges and all the backwoods places of the world for the sake of the Gentiles to hear and receive and believe the Gospel of salvation. And so, again, verse 24 is a very sobering, sobering thing. That they heard, and ultimately, they rejected. And so, in all three of these little episodes we, we see, and this all happens at, at one little dinner party, and Jesus is poking the fire. He's, he's pouring gas on it. He said, guys, I know you don't like me. Well, you're really not going to like me when I finish with you today. And so, again, you're, you're, you're religious hypocrites. You're, you're zealous for your legalistic righteousness, but you would enslave someone to a sickness when, you, when they don't have to be. You, you've, you're, you've got a, a very pompous attitude about who you are and, and what you deserve. And ultimately, you are outside of the saving grace and mercy of God. And so we can see, kind of running through all these things, I, I would say that, that Jesus practiced a very risky type of mercy. As I said, He could have said, told the guy with drops, hey, we'll deal with this tomorrow. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Dealt with it right here and there, just, and He ticked them off even more. And I think, again, just as a point of application for us, we're going to be called upon to preach a risky truth and to live out the risky implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're, we're going to find ourselves increasingly amidst controversy and conflict and that which we say and do is going to increase the consternation of a culture whose hostility is ever Increasing, he, Jesus uh, did in no, no means seek to avoid controversy. In fact, He took the controversy. He took the controversy and used it legitimately and, and desiring to expose the wickedness of uh, their, their heart. It reminds us, again, of, of this kind of urgency and even what you might say an expiration date on the, the offer of the gospel. And I, just as kind of a... a that, that is not something that reforms out of my peculiar uh, commitments to reform theology. I did not grow up in a reformed church. But I will assure you of this, that every preacher worth his salt that I ever heard reminded you that today is the day of salvation. If the Holy Spirit is working in your heart and mind, if He is convicting you of sin, you respond and you respond now. Because again, there may not be a tomorrow. By death, by the return of Christ, or just the simple fact that the Holy Spirit is no longer working in your heart, no longer calling you to this salvation. And so, again, we are reminded, we saw, I think last time or time before, yeah, there's a, there, there's a narrowness to the way. There really is. A, uh, they, you know, Jesus at least implied there'd be few, comparatively speaking. But let me tell you something, the Gospel... The invitation goes to all. The invitation goes far and wide. The, the truth of the gospel is proclaimed. And, and, and again, it seems like the implications. You would think that the religious community of the Jews would be fertile ground for the proclamation of their Messiah. Well, that historically, biblically didn't prove to be the case. That we never need to presume that we know who is going to respond to the gospel. That the gospel proclaimed will save some very unlikely people as we go along the way. Again, I think we live in a time in which the consternation of the culture is going to be inflamed. It's going to be inflamed by our statement and our living out of the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, uh, Jesus was willing to, to risk it all for sure. He, 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 he never backed down. Again, I'm, I don't want anybody to think I'm advocating trying to be some mean-spirited fundamentalist blowhard. But we're going to have to speak the truth. And anything that's spoken in love is ultimately what? The truth. Pray with me. Father, thank You for Your goodness, for Your grace, for 
uh, the work of your Son Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary, as we see, as we study uh, the story of these last weeks uh, prior to His death on the cross, He persecuted and He pursued that which you had ordained for Him, namely the death on the cross for our salvation. He did that which would bring about His ultimate execution. Again, uh, for the good of our souls, but for the very glory of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank You for Your truth. We pray these things in Jesus' name.